the Sons and Daughters of Encouragement Daily Bible Study. My name is Elia, and we've got a great study in the book of Genesis for you tonight. So we're carrying along in the book of Genesis. We're in the first chapter, and we're going to be finishing it up. And this is a really exciting study because it gets into God creating his prized possession, us, me and you. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the study. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, God. Thank you for the blessings that you rain down on us, Lord. And God, thank you for creating everything, but also for telling us, showing us that you created everything so that we have nothing to fear, Lord. We have nothing to fear, Lord. God, you created all things, and that now gives you authority over all things. And God, we're grateful that nothing can supersede your power, Lord. And God, we're grateful that you're a good God. And so we call on you. We call on your name to please give us strength and encouragement. And we ask this through this study that you would encourage and enrich our lives, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So I probably blocked the microphone for like all of that. <laughs> But that's okay. Hopefully you heard the prayer. All right. Well, we are in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. I'm going to read it. Put my Bible over there. I'm going to read it, and then we'll get into the study. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. God also said, Look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth, and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This will be food for you, for all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky, and for every creature that crawls on the earth everything having the breath of life in it. I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. Evening came, and then morning, the sixth day. Awesome. Wow. So that finishes up chapter one. I would encourage you to check out the rest of the studies so you can see the build up to this. Um, I forget if it's called a cadence or whatever it is, but this is the, the climax of God's creation process when he creates his prized possession, us. Now, it's very interesting because this is Old Testament. The Bible has the Old Testament and the New Testament. And there are many who would argue that the Old Testament has nothing to do with the New Testament they're two separate things, and they would then blaspheme that the New Testament isn't even accurate and all this crazy stuff. And remember, this is all the work of the enemy. I know some will not agree with me. I know many will not agree with me. But it's not my battle to fight. What I can tell you is that those people are very, very mistaken. The New Testament is the revelation of the Old Testament, right? I'm sure you might have heard this. I've heard it from a, a couple of different pastors. I love this, but the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So all throughout the Old Testament, everything is pointing to this Messiah, including from the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1. Check out the study on Genesis 1.1. It all points to the Messiah who is Jesus Christ. And Jesus, having come down 
as God in the flesh, manifesting himself in his own creation, came down. And because he is God, he was now able to be the atoning sacrifice to pay the penalty in our place. Me and you, the prized possession of God, we are not able to meet God's standard on our own. And therefore, he made his own way. That's the loving God. And in the beginning of this Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, he has concealed what he will reveal in the New Testament right here in verse 27. I'm sorry, verse 26, right away. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Hold on. I thought the Lord God is one. I know my Bible. And later on in the book of Deuteronomy, it says the Lord God is one. In Deuteronomy, it says, know this today and consider it in your heart. There is one God above and uh, uh, in heaven above and earth below. And that's that's it. There is no other. Listen. This is where I said the Old Testament and the New Testament are so intertwined because those who do not believe that the New Testament is real because Satan is hard at work confounding and confusing the minds of the unbelievers. Those people will argue against something that is written in the Old Testament. It's right here. It says, let us make man. I would encourage you to go online or wherever you, you know, want to go and seek out from a non-Christian perspective, readings of the Old Testament. And you will see that it does say, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Well, what is, what is God talking about? Let us. Who is he talking to? Let us. There's one God. Well, let's break it down. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, Verse 39, this is one of the ones that I just referenced. One of my all-time favorite verses in the Bible. Soak this verse in. Deuteronomy 4, 39. This is Moses talking to the people. He said, today, recognize and keep in mind that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth below. There is no other. This is very, very clear from the get-go. The Lord God is one. There is no other. Some translations say, today know this and consider it in your heart. Here it says, recognize and keep in mind. This is the Christian Standard Version translation, Christian Standard Bible. But some will say, no, like the New King James, I believe, says, know this and consider it in your heart. That's a heavy, heavy phrase. There is one God. Okay, so we're establishing from God's mouth, there's one God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, and this is a key verse. This verse, along with verse 5, but we're going to focus on verse 4. This key verse is actually the beginning of a three-part unity of verses from the Bible two from Deuteronomy and one from Numbers, that form the core affirmation of faith for Jewish people. And again, I, I am not qualified to go into detail on any of that because I, I'm not educated enough on Judaism in general. I, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm educated on the Old Testament as far as a ton of sermons, a lot of study myself, diving into commentaries and things like that, I have gained some of an understanding of, of what is in Scripture. But I will tell you this. If I do a little quick research, like I was saying you know, a few minutes ago, I can see that this verse that I'm about to read does speak of a plurality when it says the Lord God is one. Okay, so listen. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Listen, Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Like I said, I'm just going to focus on verse 4. Um, Jesus himself will actually refer to this 
thousands of years later, when he's talking to some scribes, some of the religious leaders of the time, when he's answering questions and he's kind of like, you know, astounding them with his answers. They're trying to stump him and he's kind of astounding them. And so they said, hey, what is the greatest command? What is the greatest commandment, right? Greatest command. And Jesus refers back to this, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. But listen, the Hebrew words in this verse, Deuteronomy 6, 4, they actually reference a singularity of God and what can definitely be received as a plurality of one God. What? What do you mean, Eli? A plurality of one God. That doesn't make sense. It's an oxymoron or I'm a moron, right? Whatever you want to go with. But in reality, it's describing what is said at least three other times in the Bible. When it talks about this plurality, the word that's used in Hebrew in Deuteronomy 6, 4, when it's just saying the Lord, your God, uh, I'm sorry, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. It's using a singularity and the Hebrew word that's being used because it's stating God twice. It's actually referring to what you find in three other places, one of which being Genesis chapter 2 that we're going to get into, verse 24, when he says, This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Okay, let me repeat that. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Plural, they become one. Singularity. That's the same Hebrew word that's used in Deut Deuteronomy 6.4. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. The plurality together is one God. It's very hard to argue against what it's saying there. But again, sadly, Satan has been hard at work since his fall from heaven, spending thousands of years confusing, deceiving, and derailing humans since then, since the Garden of Eden, since the beginning of human creation, Satan has been hard at work and has been very successful derailing humanity many, many, many times. And this is another way that he does it. He doesn't want us to connect the Old Testament with the New Testament because in the New Testament, the New Covenant was made. That's why it's called the New Testament. The New Covenant was made by the blood of Christ, which freed us all for all time. Whoever would receive it, the blood of Christ on the cross, whoever would receive it, frees us for all time. And the devil does not want you to have that information. And if you have the information, he doesn't want you to believe it. Why? Because Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. That's why. And you think, oh, yeah, what a bunch of nonsense, you know, demons, angels, Satan. Oh, it is very, very real. Do not be confused about it. It is extremely real. And Satan is very real. And he is definitely powerful, more powerful than, than us. However, he is not more powerful than our loving God who created the angel Lucifer who fell and became Satan. He created him, therefore holds authority over him. How do I know that? Look at the book of Job. Satan had to ask God's permission to mess around with Job. To mess around is very light to cause all the havoc that he caused in Job's life. He had to ask permission. God allowed him. Do you understand this? Satan is not in charge, and he can only be one place at a time. He is not God. He is not nearly as powerful as God, and that's what bothers him. He wants to be above God. And so he takes it out on God through us. He takes out his anger and his rebellion against God and his frustration and his bitterness and his spite against God through me and you by stealing our joy, 
killing our faith and destroying our lives. He cannot take our salvation. The Bible said once you're in the hand, God, you cannot be snatched out of the hand. Whether or not we can lose salvation, I'm not talking about. Don't have an answer for you. What I can tell you is, no matter how hard Satan tries, if you call on the name of the Lord, God is faithful. I know that. I know it. I know it. I'm filled to tell you. I'm filled with the Spirit of God to tell you, if you call on the name of the Lord, nothing can take you away from him. Nothing. Nothing can ever separate you from the love of God as given through his son, Jesus Christ, by dying on the cross for us, making a new covenant with his blood that allows us to be saved, salvation, saved from the throes of hell, the penalty of our sin. This is crucial information, and it's important. It's the most important, and Satan doesn't want you to have it and doesn't want you to believe it. But the work has already been done. Listen, this is important. This is Old Testament, right? The Lord our God is one. The Lord is one. Well, he's talking about this plurality of a singular God in the Old Testament, which is revealed in the New Testament through the revelation of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. Can I get an amen on the fact that God has revealed his singularity as the one true and living God through his triune persons of God the Father, Spirit. He is Spirit. God is love. God is light. God is Spirit. It's not a big, you know, male figure with a white beard and clouds. No, that's not God. That's our mind making that. I, I'm guilty of that too. God is Spirit. He is Spirit. Spirit. We do not see him. We see the evidence all around us of him. I'm sorry. Was my heart beating without a battery and I don't have to think about it? I'm sorry. Was I breathing overnight when I was sleeping, even though I wasn't consciously breathing? I'm sorry. Okay. So listen, the evidence of God is all around us in our moment to moment existence, living with the breath of life, the evidence of God. But God is spirit. He's invisible. So what happened? He made himself a visible manifestation when he came down as the son, God, the son, fully man and fully God in presence on the earth. The visible manifestation of the invisible God, which is spirit. And when Jesus left, he ascended after dying on the cross, paying the penalty for our sin, if we would receive the free gift of salvation by faith. Through faith alone, by grace, if we would receive it, he died, then resurrected, giving us the hope and uh, the hope of new life, ascended into heaven 40 days later. And when he left, he said, if I don't go, you won't get the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. So when he left 10 days later, the Holy Spirit came down upon the first 320 believers. 120 believers. My apologies. 120 believers. The Holy Spirit came upon them. And ever since then, we have the Holy Spirit. Read the book of Acts to understand all about that. We have the Holy Spirit with us today who reminds us of the things Jesus said and did. He's the teacher, the counselor, the comforter. He's also the regenerative force. You notice I'm saying he, the Holy Spirit, he, yes, he. The Holy Spirit is a triune person expression of the one true and living God his spirit well in the beginning in genesis 1 verse 2 right the spirit hovered over the earth god the father and god the son who was through all things from the beginning were made through him and for him through him by him and for him that's jesus and the holy spirit hovering over the waters of the earth this triune existence from the beginning, as we call the beginning, when God instituted time and made us, from the beginning, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit made us, humanity, in His image, according to His likeness, for His purpose. So when we look at that, that's a pretty heavy verse. Genesis 1, 27. 
There's a lot going on there. 26 and 27. Now listen, as far as 28 through 31, I read that all, I read 26 through 31. I'm going to read a little bit from Pastor Tony Evans' um, study Bible. I highly, highly recommend this study Bible just for me. That's why I'm reading the Christian Standard Translation. I had not yet read it until I got this study Bible. And um, I'm involved in this study Bible because I love it. Um, Pastor Tony Evans gives, gives a great message, man. He's, he's anointed. The Spirit of God has definitely filled that man and given us, um, you know, God's word through, through this man. So I highly recommend it. Tony Evans Study Bible. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read his study notes on verses 26 through 31. So this is all not my own. This is coming from Pastor Tony Evans, his exact words from his study Bible. When he's recapping his understanding of verses 26 through 31 in the first chapter of Genesis. God made his crowning achievement. Let us make man in our image visibly mirroring God's spiritual nature. So I'm going to interject my own thought here. He's breaking down when God says, let us make man in our image. He's saying that we're visibly, we're a visible manifestation mirroring his spiritual nature. Do you understand what I'm saying? We have a uh, spirit soul, right? We have this fleshly body, we have the spirit and we have our soul. So God is mirroring his spiritual nature within us according to our likeness when god said that tony evans says visibly mirroring god's functional actions so when he's saying we're visibly mirroring god's spiritual nature in the image god is spirit love light this is what we're called to be right jesus said let your light so shine and who is the light? Jesus is. Who is Jesus? God. So he's saying, let God shine through you. We're the visible mirror of his spiritual being. He said, let uh, the light shine. He said, uh, to love others as he has loved us. What did he do for us? He died for us because we couldn't do it ourselves. He sacrificed his greatest. He sacrificed it all in a very painful way not just physically, to take all the sin of the world on a perfect and pure God. He took it all for us so that we could be with him in a place of eternal um, paradise. Paradise. That's how he loved us. So we are to be the love, the, the light. This is the nature of God. We are called to do that. That's the visible mirror uh, of God's spiritual nature, the likeness visibly mirroring God's functional actions, the way he interacts. The church is the visible manifestation of God's kingdom agenda. What do I mean? The church, not the physical building, the people who believe in Christ have given their life to him and have confessed him as Lord and Savior, have received salvation by his blood on the cross. The church, the body of believers in Christ, the church is the physical manifestation, the visible, physical, on earth manifestation of God's kingdom agenda. What's a kingdom agenda? God is the king. The Bible says God is the king of kings, actually, and the Lord of lords. So God has a kingdom, a heavenly kingdom. If you read the book of Matthew, uh, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God so many times. It's all throughout. But in this specific book of Matthew that I'm referencing, oh my goodness, oh, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. He actually says the kingdom of heaven. He refers to the kingdom of heaven. Well, God has a kingdom and we are called to co-heir and co-reign with Jesus Christ, the high priest and the king. We are called to co-heir with him. Well, listen, we have that crown right now on earth. We've been given authority. The church has been given authority. We are the physical manifestation, the uh, visible manifestation of God's kingdom agenda. Well, we talked about all those things except agenda. What's the agenda? Well, the agenda is that as many as would 
would come to Christ and have eternal salvation to spend eternity in paradise with God. That's the ultimate agenda that I see in the Bible. I am not uh, the final answer. I'm not the final authority on anything. But the way I read the Bible, verses like chapter 1 of the book of Timothy, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, when he says that God wants all men and women, right? I'm not, not this, I meant parentheses, men and women, right? God wants all people to be saved and to come to an understanding of the truth. Well, what does that mean? All. I've heard that word before. It means all, everyone. God wants all people to be saved. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. How? In this way. In what way? That he gave his only begotten son that all, whosoever, not only these people, whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but shall have life everlasting. Whosoever. What does whosoever mean? It means whosoever. Whoever would. What about 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9? For God is not willing that any should perish. God is not willing that any should perish. Who's any? Any. What I'm saying is so clear. The way I read the Bible, God's kingdom agenda is that we, the church, the physical manifestation of God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven right here with our crown, when we come to co-heir with Jesus Christ and we're still here on earth, our mission the kingdom mission of his kingdom agenda is to spread the word of God. And why? So that we can be that physical manifestation of the love of God and shine the light of God. Why? So that others would find him. Why? Because he loves us. That's it. That's his agenda. I love you. Look at my shirt. I love my wife, right? I love you. That's his agenda. Knock, knock. Who's there? God. What do you want? I love you. Come back later, <laughs> right? How many times have we, you know, I'm busy right now. Uh, you know, busy doing what? In a dark place, doing something you shouldn't be, right? Well, let's open the door and let the light in. And how does God reach us? He can just reach in and grab us and say, okay, you're saved. But he chooses to allow us to make our own decision. Why? Because he loves us. Well, what do you mean because he loves us? Because he loves us enough to let us choose him for ourselves. What kind of God if he just said, okay, you're, you're going to love me? That's when people say he's egotistical or whatever because he's a jealous God. That would be an egotistical God. If he just said, you're going to love me and serve me because I said so. That would not be the loving God that he is who says, I want you <laughs> to want me. As soon as I was saying, you know, I'm thinking of that song. But but seriously, forgetting the song, he's saying, I want you to want me. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should have eternal life. That's the kingdom agenda. So God created us. Back, back to our study here, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. And I'm going to get back to what Tony Evans said. Now I'm quoting Pastor Tony Evans again from his study Bible. He said, let us is a hint at the Trinity. That's what I just spent the whole 20 minutes talking about. God the Father, Son, and the Spirit agreed to make the first human family. Now listen to this angle that Pastor T T Tony Evans goes when he's considering these verses. He says, and that family, the first human family, Adam and Eve, that family was supposed to reflect truths about God. Whoa, that's a heavy statement. The family of God creating Adam and Eve, the first human man and woman, husband and wife, when God created them, they were to reflect the truths about God. Well, what are the truths about God? God is love. God is light. God is spirit. God wants all people to be saved. God wants us for eternity. These are the truths about God. He gave us dominion. God is the king. God is the authority above all things. He's the king of kings and Lord of lords. God gave us dominion in the beginning. It was right there in verse 28. Fill the earth, fruitful, multiply, and subdue it. Rule the fish, rule the birds, rule the creatures. I give you everything. 
right away. I give you everything. Now listen. Listen to what Tony Evans says here again. Every human reflects the unity of God. Okay, so he's talking about a family. He's looking at these two verses saying, God created us in his image, his likeness. Well, now he's saying he created them male and female. That's in verse 27. Well, Pastor Tony Evans is looking at this and saying, well, okay, if he said, but he also created them male and female, I'm going to quote Tony Evans again, so our differences reflect the diversity of the Trinity too. What is he saying there? Well, I can form my own thoughts on that, but what essentially what I hear him saying is the man and the woman, as we'll come to see in chapter two, are um, the, the woman is the helper to the man, suitable not to be um, subdued by the man. She's called to submit, but the man is called to, to um, love. And how did Christ love? He died for us to make us blemish uh, without blemish, right? So there's that's a whole nother series I'm going on. But the point is this, the diversity between men and women, the reason we're so different is because we are pu pushing forth in a visible manifestation, the likeness, the image, and now the diversity of the triune God. He each uh, person of the triune God has his own, um, I want to say like, uh, not tasks, you know what I mean, but like has his own function, functionality, if you will. Each expression of this one God has that their own function. So now we have different functions in the body, men and women together, and that's the family. And there's some awesome stuff, by the way, about the kingdom family that Tony Evans put in his Christian, um, I'm sorry, in his study Bible. You want to check that out. It's on the same page as Genesis chapter one, this, this set of verses. Now, listen, I'm going to quickly say this and then we'll wrap up. He says, we, this is Tony Evans again from his study Bible. We humans are to rule on God's behalf and we are to re reproduce for his glory. Oh, check this out. Just as God handed over responsibility to the son, so that it would shine for God. Now I'm talking about the sun, S-U-N. In the beginning of the Bible that we just did a couple studies ago, God was the original light. It says God is light in the Bible, right? So God was shining light on the earth. But now he created the sun and the moon. He created the greater light to rule the day and the lesser night to, light to rule the night. So he handed responsibility of lighting the earth to his creation of the sun, S-U-N. So God gave the responsibility so that it would shine. Why? For God. The purpose of God was handed over to the responsibility of this greater light. It is for God's purpose. Well, so are we. So now getting back to what Pastor Tony Evans said, God handed over responsibility to us so that we would govern and steward his world for him. Mm, you follow this. I want my world for me. We all do. Trust me. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. The point is, if we get into this book, the Bible, and if we start to breathe in and understand who God is that gave us the breath of life, then we can understand that we're in his world for him, no matter how much it hurts sometimes, that we don't get what we wanted. We don't get what we think we needed. The loving God who created us knows all things and knows what's better for us than we could ever imagine. Tony Evans says, this is the dominion covenant that is at the heart of the expansion of God's kingdom program in history through the rule of man. Let's hold, hold on a second. This is the dominion covenant, the promise given, the bond and covenant given that we will have dominion over the earth. This is the dominion covenant. Well, what is he saying? This based on us being for God. We have rule over earth for God. He says this covenant is at the heart. What does that mean? It's at the core. It's at the core. This is at the core of the expansion of God's kingdom program. The expansion of what? God's kingdom program. What is that? The visible manifestation of God's great love for us, for all people. It says that his kingdom program expanding in history. So who's doing it? Us. We, we are performing the physical actions on earth 
to help spread God's love so that as many as would, would point back to him, receive the free gift of salvation through the blood of Christ on the cross, be raised to new life in the end times of this earth as we know it, and rule with Christ forever at the right hand of God. That's what he wants. That's this kingdom expansion through the rule of man. Very, very incredible. Last thing I want to say, the rest of those verses, 28 through 31 in Genesis chapter 1, they get into how we have dominion over all things. The birds of the uh, sky, the creatures that crawl on the earth, fish of the sea, I've given everything for you. What is it that makes us so different from all the other creations? If God gave us dominion over everything, what separates us? Well, I would argue just a, a couple of things. We could probably have an awesome discussion about this. But I picked just a few things to talk about tonight. Intellect. Human intellect. Reasoning. You could say opposing thumbs, but there are certainly plenty of God's creatures that have opposing thumbs as well. But that's definitely a big advantage in a physical sense. But I'm talking about, which of course helps with survival, right? But I'm, talk, I'm not talking about just survival. I'm talking about dominion. I'm talking about having authority over all things, not just surviving. Intellect. We can think up traps for food. We can think up systems to help us achieve getting the things we need. Now, granted, there is plenty of creatures of, of, of the earth that can come up with some pretty simple, but you know, very effective plans, but not the way humans can, not like us. We have the ability to reason through many, many steps. What about chess? I love a good game of chess. In the game of chess, if you are not many moves ahead, of where you think you want to go and where you think your opponent is going to react to your actions, then you're probably not going to win the game. In the game of chess, I must be several moves ahead. So therefore, to be several moves ahead, I have to be multifaceted in each reaction that my opponent might make to my next move, to my next two moves, to my next three moves. If I make move A, my opponent can make move A1, A2, A3, A4. If he makes A1, I'm going to move to this move, B. He makes A2, B2, right? So on and so forth. I have everything mapped out in order to defeat my opponent. Well, it's the same thing here. We can devise very elaborate thinking to help us achieve the things we want and we need. But what do we use it for? What do we use it for? Money. I mean, am I wrong? You know, like, please tell me if I'm wrong, but we use it for money. And what is the whole thing with money? Fear. What do you mean, fear? Fear. Fear of not getting what we think we need. That's what the goal is when we seek out money in a greedy way. It's fear of not having what we think we're going to need, even though we're forgetting that God provides it all. Even when I'm penniless in my pocket, God fills my spirit. He's not going to leave me penniless for long. That's not the way my God is. I know from experience. Trust me. <laughs> Trust me. I know from experience. I will be penniless, but he will not leave me penniless for long. I got to go through some trials sometimes, but maybe I got to learn a few things. Or maybe he's got a huge blessing for me around the corner. Who knows? That's our God. I don't know what his plans are, but I know they're for good. Well, anyway, what's the last thing? I'm going to close with this. What's the last thing that I could think of tonight that I wanted to focus on that separates humanity from all the other creatures? Because listen, if I go out into the wilderness, if I go out into like, you know, Africa somewhere and it's like really unsettled area, I'm probably not going to survive. I'm dead meat, you know, but that's my problem. That's my fault. You know, I don't I just don't know. I'm unprepared in that type of situation, but it doesn't mean I have to be. 
right? It doesn't mean that I have to be. I could be much better prepared to handle a situation like that. I'm just not, right? But the point I'm making is, if the wildlife can kill me so easily, but I have dominion over it, how do I express that dominion? By using my intellect, my reasoning, the brain God gave me. That's how. And I can make elaborate plans to help me to continue having authority over all that God gave us. But the last thing that really separates man from, from all other creation is our level of emotional sensitivity. This is just my opinion. I'm not a scientist here coming up with, you know, I'm not a psychologist on any of those things. What I will tell you is my personal experience. My level of emotional sensitivity separates me from other creatures and creations. I'm not saying other creatures don't have emotions. You can feel the love coming from, from a, a cat, from a dog. You can feel the love. You can see otters holding each other so that they don't float away from each other. You can see the love that a lioness gives to her you know, cubs or whatever they're called. I'm not saying they don't express emotion or feel emotion. Who am I to say that? I would actually argue very the opposite, that you can see it. What I am saying is the depth and level of emotional sensitivity. How do I know this? Why do I say this? Because John chapter 11, verse 34 or 35, I can't remember. My favorite, favorite two word verse. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. So tears, crying, this is a natural part of life. This is not something to be ashamed of. This is not something to be embarrassed about. This is not something to hide, although I hide it all the time. I hide it. I'm scared to cry in front of people. You know, my story, man, I was bullied a lot as a kid, a lot. And I was a very sensitive kid, and I cried a lot. And you better believe I, I paid a price for it when I was younger. So I'm scared to show those tears in public. I'm scared to show those tears in my own house, on my own couch. But what I'm telling you is Jesus wept. Jesus cried. And who is Jesus? God. What does it say in the book of Genesis chapter 6? God was sorry that he made man. He was regretful in his heart. It says later in the Bible, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. God feels that emotion, at least the way he would describe it to us in words we can understand in the Bible. He's relaying to us, do you understand when you feel this way? I know what that is. I made that. I know what that is. I gave you this visible visible manifestation of my likeness or, or rather my image in you through this depth of emotional sensitivity. The point I'm going to drive it home with to help you understand why this is so crucial and critical that you're in touch with that. Huh? And what I'm saying is this, when the tears are flowing, let them flow because it's time to let it go. And the reason I'm so confident when I say that is because of the last verse I want to read tonight. And then I will bid you adieu. It is Psalm 56, verse 8. When I first heard this verse, it was the day that I got saved. The day I gave my life to Jesus Christ at Core Church in Los Angeles, right off of the 10 freeway at La Cienega. God led me there, and if you heard my testimony that I left on a while back, a couple months ago, you know all about it. God led me there. It's very clear. And I got there, and I heard the message of the gospel, right, the good news, the salvation that God made for us through his son, Jesus Christ. I heard the good news, and I understood it and believed it for the first time. And what really sunk it home was a combination of Matthew chapter 11, when he's saying, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy, heavy laden. He's saying, I will give you rest for your souls. He says, take my yoke upon you because it is easy to bear. He says, I am lowly at heart and I will teach you. That's the God who touched me. I heard that set of verses and it affected me. He said, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, burdened. You carry burden with your emotional sensitivity. He said, come to me. 
and I will give you rest for your soul. I am lowly at heart. I am humble. I am gentle. I will teach you. Take my yoke upon you because my load is light. And it is easy to bear. That's the God who caught my attention with that verse. And right afterwards, <clears throat> it was driven home before I gave my life to Christ. Psalm 56, verse 8. David is writing. You yourself, he's talking to God, you yourself have recorded my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? God has a record. Really. God has a record of every single tear that has rolled down your cheek that has sat in your eye because you didn't want it to come out. The tears that didn't even come out because your eyes were so dry from crying, you couldn't even form the moisture, but you were crying. God has all of those things recorded in a book specifically about you, your wanderings. The Bible says God delights in every step of those he loves. He delights. He wants to see what decisions you're going to make. He knows the front from the end. He's already seen it all somehow. I don't understand how. But he still allows us to make our own decisions. And he's delighted in watching this take place. He's recording our wanderings. And he's keeping a bottle of remembrance for the tears we shed. Like when Jesus wept when his friend Lazarus died. And he saw the people crying, but more than anything, he saw Mary. He saw Mary fall to her knees and she said, Lord, had you been here, he would not be dead. But still, I know she had faith. But when he saw her, when he saw her reaction, he felt overwhelming compassion, overwhelming compassion to the point of weeping. Do you, I know I'm not alone right now. I have had overwhelming emotion before, many times. And God has tracked it all. And he does not take delight in the pain I feel. But he certainly does take a lot delight when I put my cares on him. And when I cast my praise on him. Even in the midst of a storm, when I praise him, I lift my hands with tears falling out of my, my, my nose, my eyes, <clears throat> my mouth. And I lift my hands and I just say, God, I love you. I don't know what you're doing, but I, I trust you. I'm scared. You know, when I come to the Lord with my praise, with my truth, that's my truth. When I come to him and approach him with the truth about where I'm really at, God, I'm scared. I'm hurting and I'm scared and I'm so lonely and I'm so afraid. When I come to him and throw that to him, what does he do? What does he do? He just surrounds me with his love and his comfort. The Holy Spirit is the comforter and he listens to my cry. And he says, hear me. I am tracking every bit of your wanderings, and I am here for you. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, so much for this time together, Lord. Thank you for your word, God. Thank you for filling me with your Holy Spirit, Lord. I pray that you would fill us all with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we would be filled with joy, peace, love, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, Lord, faithfulness, goodness, kindness. Lord, I pray that you would pour your blessings on us, Lord. And God, I pray that through the midst of the storms, Lord, that you would show up in such a mighty way. And God, you would comfort us when we're praying and praying and the answer is no. When we're praying and we're praying and the answer is not yet. Or when we're praying and we're praying and the answer is 
nothing. God, I pray that you would strengthen us and encourage us in those times of waiting that are so torturous and tumultuous, Lord. And God, that you would remind us of how much you love us and the plans you have for us that are of prosperity, not, not health, wealth, prosperity, Lord, but of a future, of a hope, of eternal salvation, if nothing else, Lord. What an, a joy that we have the eternal salvation with you, but you have a future for us. And it is not one of calamity. And for that, we are grateful. We place you in your rightful place on the throne. You are the king of all kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the one true and living God. And we put our faith and our trust in you, no matter what, Lord. And we shall not fear the war, Lord. And God, we are grateful. And we pray that you would strengthen us and encourage us in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night. I've been encouraged by this, and I pray the same for you. God bless you. Take care.